Welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm your host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the Black Hat episode for the week starting July 23, 2012. The big story this week is obviously the Black Hat and DEF CON security conferences. Black Hat just ended today and DEF CON is going to continue throughout the weekend. So this episode I'll talk about some of the stories I learned at Black Hat. So let me start with the big themes of Black Hat which seem to be shared by many of the talks this year. I'd say one of the big themes was the fact that many people are starting to realize that preventative defenses are not perfect. Despite having good technology and good policies, uh, organizations are real realizing that if you have a persistent and advanced attacker, you can get breached. So more organizations need to, to focus on things like visibility, uh, detection, and disaster recovery tools to make sure that if they do have a breach, they can find them quickly and clean up after it. Another big theme this week was the whole idea of strike back or hack back. The idea that many people are sick of, of being on the receiving end of attacks, and if they detect someone attacking them, they want to do something back. Now this idea really has many legal ramifications to it, something that Robert Clark brought up in one of his talks. A long story short, though many people are talking about strike back, it is still probably not a good idea to try to directly attack an IP that's, that's attacking you. However, many Many talks did talk about having booby-trapped files uh, that may have beacons to help them find the attacker, or maybe just files that were false, that, that threw the attacker off and, and made him think he had found something valuable when really it was fake. The final theme of the show probably was advanced malware and the idea of nation states or governments getting into cyber warfare. In fact, the whole term cyber was brought up many times during the show. It is a hot word apparently in DC right now. Many of the speakers were saying if you wanted your projects funded from the government in DC, all you had to do was put the word cyber in front of it. In any case, many people are concerned with the whole security landscape now that we have nation states and governments involved in network security. So I'll quickly share a few of the talks I saw, starting with the keynote speech of the first day, which was given by a former FBI cyber cop named Sean Henry. Essentially, his talk was talking about cyber defense, uh, how we should do some sort of uh, proactive, not necessarily strike back, but we need to proactively react to these attackers and create cyber warriors in our, our nation that are capable of defending against foreign attacks. While Henry had some interesting ideas about how you might use some of the physical and, and normal war strategy we've learned from in history to defend against cyber threats, I still think there are many legal ramifications that we have to worry about when we think about proactive defenses or any sort of strike back at all. The next briefing I saw was called Smashing the Future for Fun and Profit, a kind of play on the classic paper, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. Anyways, this was a panel discussion that included uh, many of the, the well-known researchers that spoke at the original Black Hat 15 years ago, including the founder Jeff Moss, uh, Bruce Schneier, Marcus Raynham, uh, Jennifer Granick uh, actually hosted the talk, and I think also Adam Shostak was also there. They talked about a menagerie of, of cybersecurity topics, many having to do with nation state attacks and strike back and things like that. One interesting question came up where Jennifer asked the audience if the audience was more concerned about cyber threats from governments or whether they were concerned about corporations that had a lot of data like Google or the bad guys. Surprisingly, many more hands went up for things like being worried about government attacks and about a corporations than even the bad guys themselves. One of the biggest talks from the first day came from Charlie Miller, one of my favorite uh, iOS and Apple researchers who used to be part of the NSA. His talk was titled, Don't Stand Too Close to Me, 
and was basically an analysis of the attack surface of NFC, which stands for Near Field Communications. Over the next few years, many phones in the States will gain NFC communication capability. And many phones in Europe and Japan already have this. Uh, NFC or near field communication is a lot like RFID. It's a very short wave radio signal. You literally need to be anywhere between 10 and two centimeters to be able to send this communication back and forth. But it's what many phones like the Google phone are gonna use to do a electronic wallet. So we may start paying things using our phone and near field communication. Charlie Miller did some deep research and analysis uh, towards the attack surface of NFC. He uh, essentially tried to fuzz uh, NFC drivers on various phones, including Nokia's and, and Android phones and Samsung phones, as well as some of the other uh, NFC-related software located on the phone. Uh, the good news is he found that the actual NFC drivers themselves and some of the software didn't suffer huge vulnerabilities. He found some flaws, but nothing outright horrible. However, he did find a major problem, and that is the fact that the NFC software had strong connections to other software like your browser or your image parser. Uh, this was to allow uh, you to maybe go up to a NFC tag on a movie poster, put your phone near it, and it will automatically open up your browser to take you to a website, which is convenient and nice, but the problem is this means that an attacker can put fake NFC stickers somewhere and then force your phone to go to a potentially a malicious website that can then exploit a browser vulnerability and take over your phone. So in short, while he didn't find horrible flaws in some of the NFC drivers themselves, he does think manufacturers need to put some separation between NFC and other applications, and at the very least, they need to prompt the user whenever NFC tries to do some sort of communication which could be dangerous. Black Hat Day 2 started with a keynote that involved uh, Brian Krebs interviewing Neil Stevenson, a popular science fiction author. This was a very fun uh, briefing. It has very little to do with security. They were mostly talking about uh, Neil's books, some of his, his geeky uh, pursuits in gaming and rocketry. A lot of fun if you like science fiction, which I do, but I'm not going to share the details in this podcast. After that, I went to another presentation called iOS Security. Now, this was a historic presentation as it was the first time Apple had presented at Black Hat. Uh, one of the senior security uh, researchers from Apple was there, Dallas DeAtley, as well as many other uh, members of the security team in the front row, such as Windows Snyder. Now, the presentation was just to kind of outline some of the security mechanisms in iOS devices. They talked about the secure boot mechanism, uh, the, the secure chain of trust, all the certificates they use to make sure there's a, a, a chain of trust uh, anywhere from the boot of the iOS device all the way down to downloading and running sanctioned app, uh, applications from the App Store. And they did go into a lot of detail on how the iOS device uses security certificates and, and how this chain of trust works. Now, this really isn't too much new information to the security community. Many researchers who have found vulnerabilities in Apple devices have already found these, uh, have found out how iOS devices use these certificates, and in many cases have actually found ways around it. Uh, in fact, there was another talk going on downstairs that talked about how to defeat many of the security controls Apple uses. Nonetheless, it was very nice to see Apple at Black Hat. I'm hoping that this starts a whole new wave of transparency from Apple as far as security can, is concerned, and that they take a more proactive and uh, researcher open attitude towards security. The last interesting presentation I'll mention today was one from Zachary Cutlip on routing Soho routers, or small home office routers that you can buy at many consumer shops. Specifically, he found some vulnerabilities in very specific Netgear routers uh, that many people use out there. Uh, his presentation had to do with how you could use SQL injection uh, to help deliver a buffer overflow attack to a router that happens to use a MIPS processor. And apparently there's not a lot of information on how to exploit buffer overflows on MIPS processors, so some of his research seemed to be a little new. I don't have time to go into the full details of Zachary's attack, but essentially a lot of these routers come with extra features such as the capability to stream media to uh, DNLA devices like your PlayStation or your TV, or the capability to uh, have you plug in a USB device and have it uh, share files through the router itself. Essentially, uh, 
Uh, Zachary combined many different attacks to force a buffer overflow to the MIPS processor. He first found a flaw in the SQLite database that the device used whenever you plug in an external USB device and store things like music and stuff through the router. He then found another vulnerability in the actual DNLA server, and finally he found some vulnerability in some of the code which he could use for a buffer overflow. And basically he had to use the SQL injection to get his buffer overflow into a database and then use this, this software flaw to trigger the router to pull information from the database, thus triggering the buffer overflow. Long story short, he did the classic black hat demo where he showed a root shell and gained full access to the router. Now interestingly, if you're a Netgear uh, router owner, he has not disclosed this vulnerability to Netgear yet. It, this is a O-Day vulnerability. It is out there with no patch. Uh, so if you're a Netgear router owner, you might want to pay attention to their response to this and download any sort of update if they release one. One final tip though is this does require you to be using the DNLA service which you can disable. So if you aren't using any sort of media streaming you definitely should disable that on your router. The other good news is typically DNLA is only internally accessible on your local network so hopefully internet attackers can't leverage this flaw. So that's a quick recap of my Black Hat experience so far, but there were many other briefings and DEF CON is yet to come, so I suspect there'll be many more posts and videos where I'll talk about other Black Hat incidents in the weeks and in months to come. Meanwhile, other security news doesn't stop just because of the Black Hat Security Conference. So let me quickly, quickly share some of the bigger security stories that happened this week besides Black Hat. One was a, a big new piece of Mac malware being discovered that one of the vendors is calling OSX Crisis. Uh, now this Mac Trojan, if it infects your computer, I believe it comes as a jar file. If it infects your computer, uh, it can actually infect your computer with or without root privileges. Even if it doesn't have root privileges, it can infect your computer. Once it does, it puts hooks into many instant messaging and browser programs like Safari, Microsoft Messenger, uh, ADM, Skype, and, and of course Firefox, and it can start spying on you. It also connects back to a command and control channel and sends information back every Every five minutes or so. If it does execute with root privileges, it also can put a root kit on your computer and help hide itself. Now the good news about this particular malware is the organization that found it, they actually found it on VirusTotal, one of the, the uh, malware submission sites. They haven't found it actually spreading in the wild yet. Nonetheless, it's more proof that Macs are not immune, and if you do have a Macintosh computer, it's probably about time you get anti-malware software on it. Another interesting story is in the middle of the week, Anonymous claimed that they'd gained access to 40 gigabytes of data from Australian ISPs. The next day, one of the uh, uh, one Australian organization called AAPT did confirm that their data had, uh, had been stolen. About, I think, 3.6 gigs of the, the 40 gigs they confirmed was their data. So it seems Anonymous has stolen a bunch of data. I haven't seen the public post of the data, although Anonymous does say they're going to post it in the days to come. It will be interesting to see how this plays out. One interesting tidbit is Anonymous did say they were able to gain access to this through an unpatched Adobe Cold Fusion vulnerability. So just another good anecdote to make sure that you patch all the, the critical software you use as quickly as possible. In kind of rumor news, F-Secure released a blog post talking about how uh, a person at an Iranian nuclear facility claimed that they had received new malware somewhere within the Iranian nuclear facility. Uh, basically on, on F-Secure's blog, uh, Naked Security, they received an email that they did confirm seems to be coming from a nuclear facility in Iran. Uh, and the, the member that was sending the email claimed that they received some malware. It seemed to be using Metasploit as, as part part of the way it attacked the systems. And the very interesting point was at, at various times it would force the computer that was infected to play an ACDC song at maximum volume. Now of course no one's really verified this malware. F-Secure is not sure whether this is just some sort of elaborate prank, although it does seem to really come from an email address within this nuclear facility. So most people are leaning towards the fact that this is probably just some silly hoax. Nonetheless, it's something to keep an eye on in the future. 
The final story I want to cover really, really quickly is yet another big password breach. It seems like we have one of these every week. Uh, this week it was one uh, that affected Gamingo, uh, some sort of online gaming site. Uh, basically about 11 million different credentials, or if you remove all the duplicates, maybe around 8 million credentials, were leaked to various public sites. Uh, they were hash credentials, so they do require attackers to uh, crack the hashes, but that's typically not too difficult in many cases. So you know the normal advice for this. It's been happening so regularly that by now you know that if this happens on a site you frequent, you should change your password immediately. And more importantly, do not use the same password everywhere. Uh, otherwise, every time something like this happens, you're going to have to change your password everywhere else as well. So be sure to, to use different passwords at different sites, and I highly recommend using a password vault. So that's it for this episode. Black Hat's been interesting as usual so far, and I'm sure DEF CON will bring even more stories to next week's episode. Uh, thanks for watching. If you'd like more regular security news, be sure to continue following our WatchGuard Security Center blog, and you can also follow my Twitter. I'm at SecAdept. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.